During the 400 years since the English first colonized the barrier islands, many nations have fought over them. But in none of those battles have as many lives been lost as have been claimed by the treacherous Diamond Shoals. For during much of that period, there was no light in the graveyard. The light shines in the graveyard And goes fly through the sails The sailors still remember these have forgotten tales The shifting sands is swallowed A thousand ships and more The souls of those who vanish Still walk the ocean floor I'm John Alexander, inviting you to stay with us as we take a fascinating look at America's most famous lighthouse. There are five lighthouses here along the graveyard of the Atlantic, but none is as well known as the one here at Cape Hatteras. It's not only a warning to mariners, but it's a memorial to the ships and lives that have been lost out there on Diamond Shoals. The earliest victims were from Spanish galleons, whose captains had gambled they could survive Diamond Shoals and get their cargoes of gold back to Spain more quickly if they caught the Gulf Stream in the Caribbean and followed it northward to the Carolina coast, then hung a sharp right at Cape Hatteras to cross the Atlantic. The Outer Banks of North Carolina really a string of, uh, of low, uh, narrow, sandy islands that stretch along the coast, uh, all the way from above the Virginia line uh, down to well below uh, Beaufort Inlet, a distance of more than 150 miles. Uh, they really serve as sort of a barrier reef, protecting the mainland of North Carolina from the ravages of the sea. But a ship, even one with current charts, provides little protection from the fierce storms that frequently enshroud a region that has become burial place of a thousand ships. The focal point is Cape Hatteras, the easternmost tip of the United States, where the Gulf Stream collides with the southbound Labrador Current, and where the continent makes a pronounced bend. And in fact, this is so pronounced that uh, Jacksonville, Florida, which most people would think of being south of Cape Hatteras, is actually more to the west of Cape Hatteras than to the south of the, of the Cape. David Stick is an historian and author of several books on the subject of the Outer Banks. He says you can't really separate the people from the sea any more than you can separate the history of the lighthouse from their lives. It's the symbol of an era. The very uh, first residents came there because of this proximity to the sea. Uh, some were pilots, piloting vessels in the colonial days uh, uh, through the inlets of the Outer Banks. Uh, uh, some others were shipwrecked there. Animals as well as people sometimes survive those early wrecks. The Outer Bank ponies, for example, are believed to be descended from animals whose masters came to colonize in the late 1500s. Well, I'd need my ponies, I'll tell you the truth, I, I don't remember ever hearing anybody where they came from. But when I was a kid, these ponies used to be, the island used to be full of them. We had a lot of sheep, we had cattle, and I used to go to school, we had cattle laying on the island. We used, sometimes we had to step over them to get, get, to get by. Clinton Gaskell was born in the shadow of the Ocracoke Light just after the turn of the century. He says that bankers have always been resourceful when it comes to shipwrecks. The lumber would buy his show, and people would get together and pick it up. You know, a lot of them built houses out. Uh, I remember my father going out to the inlet and tide coming in, that we would be picking up lumber in the boat, bringing it to shore. 
Nowhere along the Outer Banks is there a better example of this resourcefulness than along Howard Street on Ocracook Island. Lawton Howard's family owned the whole island back in the 1700s. The Howards that took bought the island for the race stock, and that's how we got the, We owned the whole island one time, and now we have the least of anybody. <laughs> this is the house Howard was born in, and like several still standing on Howard Street, it contains salvage from the sea. Because I've seen some of the uh, boards off and seen how it was put together and what it was made out of. Now those studdings there are made four by sixes, about two foot apart, and uh, put together with wooden pegs. Oh, so I, I think it must be over 100 years old. I'm sure it is. There are certain rules and regulations about this that are accepted by everybody, unwritten. Um, what washes up on the, on the beach, traditionally, belongs to the first person who gets it. Legend has it that on dark moonless nights a few hundred years ago, land pirates would tie a lantern around a horse's neck and parade it up and down the dunes. From a few miles out at sea, the bobbing light resembled another ship closer in. So the captain might try hugging the shore. Imagine his surprise when the next sound he heard was a shoal ripping into the underside of his vessel. And he found that the light was simply a trick to beach his cargo. Some say that's how Nags Head got its name. As early as 1696, the Outer Banks had a reputation for harboring pirates. And the most famous of all these lusty buccaneers was Edward Teach. The dreaded Blackbeard used the maze of waterways and inlets for sanctuary and surprise. In 1718, he and his men were cornered by a Royal Navy force led by Lieutenant Robert Maynard. Now, there are many versions of this battle, and about the only thing they agree on is that Blackbeard was beheaded. Several versions insist his ornery soul still stalks Oak Crook Inlet, where it all happened, and manifests itself in the form of an eerie glow. You are sitting, if it were nighttime, you might or you might not see Teacher's Light right out that window. The legend of Teacher's Light has been handed down by the natives of Stumpy Point Village in Dare County, North Carolina for three centuries. Now Wise Wector's roots reach deeply into the Outer Bank sands. Hundreds of years ago, some of her ancestors floated ashore on barrels after a shipwreck near Hatteras. The retired teacher is author of several young people's books, including Teacher's Light. According to legend, the light guards one of the many treasures buried by Edward Teach. Will Teach's light just hover, or will it do a devil dance tonight? Have you ever seen the light? Many times, many times. So has he, my husband. So has anybody that's lived in this village any length of time. And sometimes it will go way up. Sometimes it'll go right down to the edge of the trees. You look and say, well, I wonder where it'll go now. And you don't see it no more. No one has ever come up with a good explanation of what teacher's light may be. But there is more tangible evidence of another period of Outer Banks history. But this is an authentic Yankee beer bottle. And Hubby Blivin brought it up out of Croatan Sound. And he gave it to me for a birthday present. And I wouldn't take a thousand dollars for it. The light in the graveyard back during the Civil War was but half as tall and not nearly so bright as this one. We're talking about uh, using whale oil at that time as the fuel. Uh, the keeper had to haul that, uh, that oil every day up those uh, 90 feet of, of steps in, in order to make sure that the light was still operating. They, in the 1850s, I think it was, extended the height to 150 feet. Now, that was quite an operation, too, uh, taking a 90-foot base and going up another 60 feet with it. This is the Croatoan Sound, quite a few miles north of the lighthouse. But here on Roanoke Island is where some of the outnumbered Confederate troops took up a last stand before the Union wrested control of the region, giving them a first-rate base on the Atlantic. It's also proved to be a first-rate hunting ground for Hubby Bliven. Uh, Hubby, I see you haven't had too much luck in finding anything to add to your collection today. Not too good, John. It's a little bit murky out there. Can't, visibility's not too good. What is it that makes this area so special to divers? 
Behind me is the remains of a, what is left of a Civil War fort, Fort Huger. Blevin, who lives in Manteo, is a photographer and artist whose specialty is the area's wildlife. As you can see, his brushes and cameras are capturing some beautiful moments. He's also a specialist when it comes to Civil War history on the Outer Banks and is quite interested in the preservation of relics. As a matter of fact, many of the ones that he paints have been reclaimed from the sea by Hubby or his sons. Well, it's taking time, but uh, it's like fishing. You have to go fishing to catch fish. So if you go looking before long, you'll be, uh, find something. His odds are with you. This photo of Fort Huger's remains was taken by Bliven just a few years ago. But now, this is all erosion has left. A hundred some years ago, 120, 25 years ago, there were uh, three lines of sand dunes running parallel to the shore, and uh, this is the remaining dune line. So by checking deeds, I find that around five, six hundred feet of the shoreline is actually washed away. What role did the lighthouse play in the Civil War? Well, bas basically like it uh, does now, of course, guiding ships, but uh, a lot of Unusual things uh, did take place there under war conditions. Uh, the Confederate Army actually removed the lenses from the lighthouse itself and, uh, and hit them, so it couldn't be used anymore. They apparently intended to destroy the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, but the Union forces were coming down on them rapidly from the north, down the Outer Banks. And so all they were able to do was to, to make it inoperative, remove the lens. Uh, so it survived the Civil War. It's doubtful that even if the lighthouse at Hatteras had been working, the monitor could have been saved. The famous ironclad sank in a gale not too long after Matthew Brady took this picture of the crew. It was being towed to do battle with Confederate ships in South Carolina waters. Today's light in the graveyard is considerably brighter than even its first beam. This was the lens used back in 1870 to reflect the flame from the oil lamp. And it contains over 1,000 pieces of glass. Now, a thousand watt bulb with two mirrors throws an 800,000 candle power rotating beam 20 miles, six miles further than the beginning of the dreaded Diamond Shoals. I don't know how the devil they ever did it, frankly. It just seems to me impossible, such a massive structure. A um, man named Dexter Stetson, whom they got as the superintendent on this job, and he uh, apparently uh, was had the typical ingenuity of so many uh, people in this area. And they were talking about a million bricks just to begin with to build that structure, plus the huge boulders uh, at the base, plus all the cement and, and all of the other, uh, 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 and, the, and all of the iron for the stairways and the lantern and everything else. From the very beginning, the Lighthouse Board insisted that quality materials and workmanship be the hallmark of the Hatteras Light. And even today, as you climb the winding stairs, <laughs> pausing now and then on a landing to catch your breath, you can't help but marvel at its sturdiness. Arriving at the balcony level, just before you go outside, the original gears and pulleys, with electrical wiring added later, are reminders of just what an important structure this was. Outside, it's simply breathtaking. You can almost see the old clipper ships. Some of these old Kennekeet residents told me many years ago that they had seen as many as 150 sail at one time out there, 150 vessels tacking back and forth. You can envision what would happen uh, when there was a shift. When the wind started coming from the northeast, many of them piled up on the beach or on Diamond Shoals, which is why I suppose, more than any other reason, that area has become known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. The shifting sands of swallow A thousand ships and more The souls of those who vanished Still walk the ocean floor And they asked me, he says, I want to know something about this lighthouse up here, Buckton. I said, what do you want to know? said, how did they get those stripes around, twisted around that lighthouse? I said, well, that was easy. I said, they paid them straight up and down, and then they said they twisted the lighthouse, so that's how they got them around. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>
The rocker Lawton Howard sitting in is a shipwreck relic from his grandfather, who was the captain of the Cape Hatteras Life Saving Station. I guess there was nobody on there when he came ashore, so he got this and a keg of whiskey. The Cape Hatteras Life Saving Station was but one of several up and down the Outer Banks, and each had its heroic history, partly because hurricanes like this one have been known to strike the Hatteras area with a vengeance. And back in August of 1899, one drove a half dozen vessels up onto the beaches, plus the light ship that normally was anchored 12 miles out at Diamond Shoals. As the storm subsided, Life Station Patrolman Rasmus Midget, making his rounds on an Outer Banks pony, spotted the Priscilla beached and breaking up in huge waves. Midget managed to save the lives of 10 men still on board, and they later all posed for this picture. The life-saving station at Chickamacomico has been added to the National Register of Historic Places, a tribute to the men whose job was taken over by the Coast Guard when it was formed shortly before the First World War. And of course, out from there, about 15 miles off, they had a light ship that was right in sync with the lighthouse. And of course, in World War I, that light ship was sunk by the Germans. I saw as many as six tankers that had been torpedoed and were burning offshore, three to four miles offshore, in one day. Outer bankers were a lot closer to the action then than some of the troops in Europe. And it was also a time when the lighthouse was darkest and facing its most serious challenge from the sea. The sea had eroded the sands dangerously close to the structure's foundation, and it was feared the entire brick tower would crumble. But as the sea returned more and more sand to the base of the lighthouse, it was declared safe enough to relight in 1950. This takes you out to the point. Uh, where everybody gathers to fish, and you have to use a four-wheel drive vehicle. There's no way you can get out. It's a long walk. And What's that over there? It looks like an old wreck. That's the old wreck of the Altoona that was uncovered during a storm in 1875, I understand. The ship was uh, sailing. What about the area over there? It looks like uh, erosion's taking its toll yes, out Yes, I see the sea tides running in on it. It's uh, been quite a battle. All summer this has been eating in, and I've seen it all completely covered with water and the sand blowing. Uh, it's really a constant battle with this. Uh, Mother Nature wants in her way. Outer bankers have learned to take the good with the bad. And nor'easters can be very, very bad. It was just one such nor'easter a few years back that wiped out the remains of the foundation of the first Hatteras Lighthouse built back in 1802. It had been dynamited into a crumbled heap in 1870 when the present structure was completed. It, it just like a big arm came in and scooped, scooped the whole hill, the bricks, everything and all of a sudden it was gone that big arm just left that big big plot of sand it's gone it's unreal what we're talking about is is an area that is constantly subjected to erosion and accretion and gradually it has moved toward the, the inland area so that there's been more erosion than there has been accretion so you know, if 100 feet eroded in a given period and then 75 might come back, and the result is that, that it has moved uh, uh, several hundred yards since that lighthouse was built. In many ways, the nor'easter of 1981 that wiped out the ruins of the original 1802 Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was a wake-up call. This lighthouse, too, was vulnerable. Ranger Kent Turner showed me just how close the ocean had come to the base of the lighthouse in the mid-1980s and he described how they were using a system of dikes, groins, and sandbags to prevent the overwash of the Atlantic from getting into the base of the lighthouse. Several plans were put forth on how best to preserve the structure. As the debate dragged on over how best to proceed, the National Seashore and the Corps of Engineers knew that if they didn't take some interim or temporary measures, there might not be anything left to preserve. One preservation plan put forth called for encircling the base of the lighthouse with a concrete and steel seawall that would protect it. If erosion continued at its present pace, the backers said, by 2050 or so, the lighthouse would be secure on its own little island, still standing where it was originally constructed. Another plan, originally presented by a private organization, documented new relocation technologies that convinced many that indeed this lighthouse could be picked up and moved further inland. 
Still others, though, did not want to spend large sums of money necessary to implement any preservation plan. They favored letting nature take its course. After all, they argued, the structure was no longer needed by mariners. Um, I feel very strongly that it should be saved. Uh, if for no other reason, that this lighthouse, to begin with, is the largest brick lighthouse in America. Um, probably as famous as any other lighthouse in this country, maybe in the world. But it is more than that. It is really the symbol of our nation's first national seashore recreational area. For more than a decade, scientists, engineers, the public, and local residents argued over the best way to proceed. Those who favored moving the lighthouse survived court challenges and won the debate. Naysayers warned it was an impossible task, that when the dust settled, all that would be left was a big bill and a pile of over 100-year-old bricks. Moving began June 17, 1999. It took 23 days for the mammoth structure to move the 2,900 feet to its new foundation. As people marveled at this tremendous civil engineering challenge, and some expressed anxiety over whether the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse could survive this latest obstacle, one person confidently pointed out that the structure had already survived at least 40 hurricanes and been pounded by hundreds of nor'easters. That it had trembled and swayed enough to knock workers on top off their feet during that 7.7 .7 Richter scale earthquake that was centered in Charleston, South Carolina in 1886, but shook off that threat with only a few cracked lantern panes. They pointed out also that the Hatteras Light had been a beacon of freedom to our navies during two world wars and they had no doubt that it would also survive this challenge. It did, and its light was relit in ceremony in November of 1999. Although its beacon is no longer needed by mariners, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse continues to serve as a reminder of its importance in the past, of the lives it has saved during its watch over Diamond Shoals, the graveyard of the Atlantic, and of the lives lost when there was no light in the graveyard. Coming from the sea They're dying in their voices In distant harmony A sailing ship a tremble Sliding down a wave I could hear them screaming What goes down now, brothers, what goes down? Sell my soul for some solid ground. Devil, don't take me, let me go home. Got me a woman And she's all alone Driftwood broken, battered Beaten by the storm Was it once a schooner? Did lonely widows mourn? Standing in the shelter Of a friendly placid cove I could hear them screaming What goes down now? Brothers, what goes down? Sell my soul for Some solid ground 
Call a man 